triglycerides is a fancy chemical name for what, in the world of food, we tend to refer to either as fat or as oil. Chemically, the main components of these are quite similar. However, one gets the name of oil because its, its chemical makeup is such that it tends to be liquid at room temperature, whereas one gets the name of fat because it tends to be solid at room temperature. But this is a distinction that uh, doesn't change the fact that if you look at the chemical, they look pretty much the same with difference in chain length, chain length and perhaps saturation. So what do I mean by chain length and saturation? Well, here is a possible triglyceride. So you'll notice there is the glycerol backbone, which is this bit here. And then we have long carbon chains hanging out this way. Remember there's hydrogen stuck to them too. And each of these, if you broke it off of the glycerol backbone, would be a fatty acid. So we call this a triglyceride. Here's the three things. One, two, three. And the glycerol backbone is there. Now, for any given fat molecule, each of these three fatty acids may be the same, or more often, they are different. And they may be uh, different in terms of number of carbons, so they can have longer or shorter chains, um, and they can be different in terms of saturation. And what do we mean by saturation? Well, this here, this chain that I am circling in yellow, has as many hydrogens stuck to it as it's possible for it to have. Each of these little up and down jags is a carbon, and each of them has two hydrogens hanging off of it for the ones that are in the main chain, and then three for the very end. I'm not going to put in every single uh, hydrogen, but you get the idea. It is saturated. That is, it's holding as much as it can hold of the hydrogens. This next fatty acid chain down on the same molecule, you will notice, has a double bond. That means it has more space for hydrogens than it's holding. So this one is unsaturated. Sorry about the lawnmower, folks. Now, what makes all that interesting? Well, I'll show you more on the next page. I'm going to abbreviate drawing a triglyceride by drawing it somewhat like this. Okay, that's an imprecise drawing, but it gives you an idea that it's three chains all stuck to a shorter chain that's holding them together. So, as mentioned previously, we tend to have, so we, everyone starts out with the oxygen um, and the carbon with the double bond to another oxygen. I'm not, this is the only time I'm going to uh, redraw this out because it makes it a little messy. But here is a uh, triglyceride attached to nothing but saturated fatty acids. And in nature, we tend to find the fatty acids with between six carbons and about, say, 20, 22 carbons. There are some that are longer, there are some that are shorter, but most of the time you'll be seeing things in this range. And as I said earlier, just because this uh, triglyceride comes from a single source doesn't mean all of those will be identical molecules. I don't think it's all that important to get the names of every single one of these. Each one has its own name. But uh, C18, saturated, is stearic acid, and maybe you've heard about that before because it's uh, a popular source for making soap out of. Now, some fatty acids, now I'm not going to draw an entire fat molecule now, I'm just going to look at a fatty acid right now. So here is a, un a very popular unsaturated fatty acid. So it's got the carbon at the end, and then I'm going to go, so that's one, 
two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then it's got a double bond to the next carbon. And then it's got another one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, before we get to the uh, C bond OH, double bond O, which is where it would normally be stuck to the glycerol. So that's the end that would be stuck with uh, three other things. And this is oleic acid, which you may glean from the name, is found uh, primarily in olive oil, but it turns up in a lot of places, and it's not the only thing that's in olive oil. Just remember this, almost no commercial uh, oil or fat that you would buy would be just one fatty acid over and over again. Almost all of them are mixes. Now, a polyunsaturated fat, and yes, I cheated and copied it from Wikipedia because it gets really complicated to draw, has multiple instances where there are those double bonds. Now, let's talk about some of the consequences of the structure of uh, fats and their fatty acids, because it changes both the physical behavior when it's just sitting around, uh, it changes how people can digest it, and it changes how we can use it in a culinary sense. So as a general rule of thumb, fats tend to be more saturated and longer chain, whereas things we tend to call oils tend to be unsaturated or polyunsaturated, and may be shorter chain. And how does this work? Well, I'm going to go back to the really simple drawing. If you remember kind of what uh, unsatur uh, what the saturated fatty acids look like, you could see that they really line up quite well. And what that means is if you have a bunch of these, sitting around next to each other, they tend to align with each other. Do you see how I'm ending up drawing that? And uh, they, in fact, uh, have weak, so not uh, certainly not covalent chemical bonds, uh, but they certainly benefit from uh, van der Waals type bonding. Uh, because they can align so well and get so nice and close. And what does that all mean? For those of you who've been out of chemistry for a while, well, that means that it's relatively easy for them to form crystals. And uh, that those crystals are relatively stable. And uh, my other big class that I love to teach is thermodynamics. And Thermodynamically, that means when something is very stable, it takes a lot of energy uh, to disrupt it. So these end up with a high melting point. And when I say high, I mean, you know, we're not talking 500 degrees. We're talking, say, where, when does butter melt? Butter might melt. Uh, more around 40 degrees C-ish, you know? Um, so that means at most room temperatures, it's stable as a solid. And there's a lot of stearic acid, the saturated fatty acid in butter. Now, if we go think about oils, and I try and draw a picture that same way with oils, maybe it's got a couple of saturated chains, and then it's got, boom, that unsaturated chain. And I'll draw another one, boom, with that unsaturated chain. And so you can see what's happening here. If you could look down at the molecular level, these, you know, maybe they line up on this side, but they don't line up quite so well. They don't pack quite so well. Um, and that means they don't crystallize until you've taken a lot more energy out of them and really forced them to uh, sit next to each other. Because this kink here that came from that unsaturated double bond, 
puts a puts a bend in the molecule means that it has a very low melting point. So you'd have to say stick it in the fridge in order to get it to be a solid. And so this is here, uh, well, this would be butter, this would be olive oil. And another popular thing uh, that's important to know about fat is you've heard about various named fatty acids, say omega-3 fatty acids. What that is telling you about is the position of those unsaturated bonds. And it could be the position of those bonds relative to each other in a, uh, un, a polyunsaturated uh, oil, uh, or it, um, and it also is the position of those unsaturated bonds relative to the overall uh, carbon chain, that whole fatty acid chain. And so some of these uh, fatty acids are particularly useful to the body uh, because they get used in the formation of other things that your body needs. And so that's why they might be particularly, quote unquote, good for you, because your uh, body, rather than synthesizing them from scratch, harvests them out of the food and reuses them. So uh, that's what's uh, happening there. And we can, if you want to get into it at some point, we can go through all of the uh, organic chemistry and biochemistry nomenclature that would tell you what omega and three together mean. But overall, you just it's just uh, easy enough to know. It, has, it tells you something about the position of the unsaturated bond in a fatty acid. So why do fats exist? Uh, fats exist uh, as energy storage. And again, I teach thermodynamics, so I know energy storage is not exactly the most precise way we could talk about it, but it's a functional way to talk about it. And fats are something that uh, animals make. So, right, like if you have beef, there's generally fat in it. Uh, and fats also come from plant sources. They tend to be a little bit different from each other. Uh, fats that are coming from animal sources often tend to be more of the saturated longer chain type, whereas uh, fats from uh, plant sources tend to be more of the oil type, but there are exceptions all across the board. Uh, for example, fish tend to be uh, tend to have fats that uh, often fall into the oily region, and a thing like an avocado or a coconut has a fat that uh, is <clears throat> uh, more in the fat region, more of a solid. And uh, so a lovely thing about fats is they taste good. And you're like, really, lady? Um, <laughs> yes, yes, they do, in fact, taste good. We are programmed to think fat tastes good, possibly not all by itself, but when it's mixed with other things, if you do a blind taste test, people will pick the thing with more fat in it almost every single time. Um, another thing that's important about fats is that they are not water soluble. So you'll notice a big difference between these triglycerides and the sugars that we talked about is there's a lot less oxygen going on here, right? So we've got a little bit of oxygen down here at the one end uh, where our glycerol is. And then we've got a whole bunch of just carbons and hydrogens only out at the other end. And what that means is, uh, uh, and again, people who've had more chemistry will be uh, familiar with this idea. So forgive me that I'm going to talk through this a little bit. Um, if you think about what water is shaped like, it's two hydrogens, which are very small, and a big old oxygen. And so this is what we'd call a polar 
molecule. This molecule has a uh, has its charges, its electrons kind of have a direction to them. And that means other things whose charges have a direction to them uh, tend to mix very well with it. So like salt dissolves in water and sugars tend to dissolve in water because they're covered with other oxygens and uh, they like dissolves like. On the other hand, if you look at this big long carbons and hydrogens chain here that's on this fat, it's what's called nonpolar. If you look at that carbon, it's got four bonds. They're coming off of it in different directions. It's not unbalanced. It's very nicely, it's very nicely balanced. It's not looking, its charges are not looking for somewhere to go. And yes, here we go. The star of simplification shows up. Yes, I just glossed over something that takes three weeks in a proper chemistry class in two sentences. But the bottom line is here that we have some food related chemicals that are nonpolar and a lot of food related chemicals that are polar. And polar and nonpolar things don't mix. And you can go off uh, into your kitchen laboratory and observe this. Add some olive oil to a big glass of water, see what happens. They don't mix to an appreciable extent. Then take that same glass of water that's got the slick of oil on top of it, throw some salt into it. You'll notice the salt also doesn't dissolve into the nonpolar oil, but it does dissolve into the water. And uh, this is important from a culinary perspective because some foods that we like uh, involve getting fat to stay mixed with water. Think of salad dressing or mayonnaise. And uh, also some chemicals that we'd really like to taste. Uh, for example, you could say um, capsaicin, the hot and hot pepper, uh, dissolve better in oils or nonpolar solvents than in water. And we can use that to alter the flavor that uh, people perceive in things that we make. 